Hello, my friends, and welcome to the Bible in Order, where we are chronologically going through the entire Bible in one year. Today's reading for November 4th is Matthew 22 and Mark chapter 12. Matthew 22 begins with the wedding banquet parable where Jesus tells this story, this analogy, in order to make a point. It is very tempting to take these words for granted, to not consider carefully what they are. But remember, Jesus is the Son of God. He is literally God in the flesh. God took his very heart, all of his emotions, and placed them within a person. Because of God's character and who God is, it overshadowed the temptation for sin. There was still a temptation for sin. There was still a temptation to do what felt good instead of what was right. But he withstood all of that temptation every day of his life and lived his life for the express purpose of showing the world what the heart of the Father is and to redeem those who have been lost. So he lives this perfect life, an expression of what God the Father was feeling. It was pointing people towards what God the Father was seeing. Every word that Jesus spoke was a message. It was a sermon. It was showing us God is like this. He's not like that. He's loving. He's not about keeping rules. He's about having a relationship. Even in your relationship with God as you pray, it's not about the clothes you wear or the fancy words you use or how long you drone on trying to impress people with how eloquent you can be when you pray. It's about expressing your heart. It's about being real. It's so easy to skip over the power of the author of these pages. So I pray, God, realign our hearts. Help us to see who it is who's speaking to us here in these pages. As we discuss this parable of the wedding banquet, let it sink in that God is trying to teach us something here that we God's people are invited to a wedding banquet, the marriage supper of the Lamb. There will be a time in the future where all people have an opportunity to sit down and sup, eat and fellowship with this King of Kings, Jesus, as he returns in his glorified form. And yet, all of those who are invited, many will decline the invitation. Oh, they'll RSVP. They'll pray that prayer asking Jesus to come into their heart. They'll say they want to be there, but when the time comes, they'll not be willing to do the things that he wants us to do. They'll be too busy about the cares of this world to properly adorn themselves or to even take a break and be there when the time comes. And so others will be grafted in. Those who were originally invited didn't want to come. So everybody else come. We've got to fill the seats. And then some will come and they'll, they won't they will be dressed appropriately. They won't be clothed in the righteousness of Christ. And so they'll be thrown out too. And that actual wedding party will be much smaller than it could have been because so many people didn't place a proper value on their relationship with the king. Mark 12 diverges from Matthew 22 by beginning with the parable of the vineyard owner. Same basic principles. There's a vineyard owner. He creates a tower. He plants a vineyard. He puts a wall around it. He leases it to tenant farmers who are unwilling to share with him any of their bountiful crop. Everything was done for them. All they had to do was tend it and then reap the harvest and give the first fruits back to the owner, but they wanted to keep it all for themselves. And when the messengers came to request payment, they rejected them. They locked them out. When the vineyard owner sends his own son to try to reason with these people to collect the payment that is due them, they kill him as well. And so it's only fitting for this vineyard owner to throw these people out, to rout them, to punish them, to inflict on them exactly what they deserve. Those who were invited, those to whom the kingdom was least, rejected him. 
They stole from him and they will pay the price. As Jesus is telling these parables, the religious leaders want to arrest him. They want to kill him. They want to fulfill the prophecy of the vineyard owner as they kill his son, but they're afraid of the crowds because the crowds recognize that he's speaking the truth and there's power and authority in it and it's fresh. Then they sent some of their people to trap him. They set the stage. They ask him this question, is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? This question was a trap because if he said, yes, pay taxes to Caesar, they would accuse him before the Jews of siding with Rome, which was a foreign occupying force. Israel was subject to having been conquered by Rome. But if Jesus, on the other hand, said, don't pay taxes, then they would accuse him before Rome. This is an insurrectionist. He's not going along with your law. He doesn't recognize the authority of Caesar. Jesus, in his divine wisdom, says, show me one of your coins. It's got a picture of Caesar on it. Give unto Caesar what is Caesar's. Give unto God what is God's. It's interesting that the coin had Caesar's image on it. But we ourselves as people have God's image on us. We were created in his image. We should be giving to God what is God's. Have you given yourself to him? Have you submitted your will to his leadership? That's what Jesus is saying here. It's not either or, friends. It's both and. Yes, you have to pay taxes. Yes, you have to submit yourself to God's leadership. It'll be the best decision you ever make. And then the Sadducees come along trying to trap him. They don't believe in the resurrection, mind you. So they come up with this question. Jesus, man, gets married. He dies. His brother fulfills the custom, marries his wife because he had no children. He dies, and so on and so on. There are seven brothers. Each of them die. Finally, the woman dies too. In this coming resurrection, whose wife will she be? Jesus says, you don't understand. In the resurrection, they won't be given in marriage. There won't be marriage. They're not even going to be male and female. They'll be like the angels. Angels don't get married and have babies. Neither shall it be in the resurrection. One of the scribes was there and was impressed with how Jesus handled the arguments against this, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. So he asks Jesus a question, what's the most important command of all? Jesus answered, the most important is listen, Israel, or hear, O Israel. Yahweh, our God, Yahweh is one. You shall love Yahweh, your God, with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind, and with all of your strength. The second is to love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other command greater than these. The scribe agrees. You're correct. I agree with you. These commands are more important than sacrifice. They're more important than the burnt offerings. There's nothing more important than these commands. I, I agree with you, Jesus. Jesus responds, You are not far from the kingdom of heaven. You're close. Some people listening to this today are close to the kingdom of heaven. You know the truth. You know that Jesus died and rose from the grave. You know he paid the penalty for sin and he rose again, conquering sin and death. You know that he's God's son. You know that the Bible is the word of God. It's written. It's, it's true. You would even agree that we are to love God, although you might not fully understand it, not that any of us do. And you agree that it's good to love your neighbor. We should love the people around us more than we love ourselves. And yet there's this little part of your life that you're not willing to let go of, not willing to let him be in control of, it's just something that you're holding on to. Maybe it's a relationship. Maybe it's an old habit that is keeping you bound. Something you know you shouldn't do, and yet you still do it. Just like to encourage you. It's okay to let that go. You'll be glad you did. Perhaps you don't even realize it, but when you do something you know you're not supposed to do, and you do it repeatedly, you're actually partnering with a demon. You're submitting to leadership. You just didn't know it was the leadership of the enemy 
who is opposed to the things of God, and it's impossible to serve two masters. Jesus is a good leader. He is a loving king. He wants to take all of your wounds and give you healing. He wants to take your burdens and give you peace. But it requires full, complete, total submission to him. We must all turn to him, turn away from our sins, turn away from our bad habits. Give him control. You don't have to be perfect to come to him. He says, come as you are. But as we submit to his leadership, we don't stay as we are. We are transformed more and more into his image over time. Friends, if you're following Jesus, or you say you are, and you have the same bad habits today that you had a year ago or five or ten years ago, you're not continually being transformed and made more like him, there's a problem. Perhaps you're stuck on a speed bump. Let it go, whatever it is. Whatever he's convicting you of in your heart right now, let it go. Submit to him. Let him be leader in all areas of your life. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed that starts off so small and yet it grows and it overtakes the entire garden. As you're growing in him, his leadership will expand into every aspect of your life if you let it. These Pharisees, Sadducees, and scribes had asked Jesus enough questions at this point, and he turns the table on them. He asks them a question about the prophecies of King David in the Psalms, where David actually wrote about Jesus. From whom is the Messiah to be born? From what genealogical line? Oh, he's the son of David, of course. Well, if David is his father, how is it that he says, Yahweh said to my Lord, referring to the Messiah, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. If David calls the Messiah Lord, how can he be his son? No one was able to answer him at all. And then they stopped asking him questions because they realized they were outmatched. He is the matchless king. All praise, honor, glory is due him. And what's amazing is he blesses us as we bless him. And if any of us love him, it's because he loved us first. Amazing. God bless you, my friends. Thank you for being on this journey with me. And for those of you who are interested, I am a listing agent. I'm a realtor in Southwest Florida with Call It Closed International Realty. I am also a managing broker for Call It Closed in North Carolina and in South Carolina. If you're an agent there, I would love to be your broker in charge. We're also building a team of premier real estate agents all around the country and even around the world. Reach out to me through agentdaviddoty.com and thank you for your consideration.